Good evening, everyone. We're just going to give it a few more minutes for uh, folks to join, and we'll probably start in about four or five minutes. Thanks for joining. Thanks everyone so much for joining us tonight. We're just gonna give it one more minute for people to join, but while we're waiting, um, feel free to put your name and which borough you're joining us from tonight in the chat um, so we can get to know each other a little bit tonight. Great. Well, I think we can go ahead and get started. Hi, everyone. Uh, my name is Claudia Vijad Lehman. I'm an energy policy advisor at the New York City Mayor's Office of Climate and Environmental Justice. Um, and thanks so much for joining us tonight to talk about the city's energy transition. Um, this is the second of our two technical sessions. We had one last night, and I see at least one or two familiar names. So thanks to those of you who are uh, repeat joiners, and welcome to all of the new people as well. Um, so a quick overview of tonight, I'll kick us off with a, pre, a brief uh, overview of New York City's energy goals and how the Power Up NYC initiative fits into that. And then I'll pass it over to our consultant team at E3 to get into the specifics of the research topics that we're going to focus on today um, related to electrifying buildings and transportation. Um, so I am fortunate enough to work in the city of New York where I was born and raised. And on the next slide, you'll see 
our commitments. Um, the New York, New York City is taking the climate crisis seriously, and we have a goal to achieve carbon neutrality by 2050, which includes 100% clean electricity by 2040, um, and a goal to ensure that as we transition to clean energy that we do so equitably, and that we're really prioritizing, for example, clean air and healthier environments for frontline communities, um, and enabling broader participation in energy planning, which is part of the reason that we're here today. Um, affordability is a key goal when it comes to the clean energy transition. Right now, um, energy continues to be deeply unaffordable in the city. We have one and a half million residents who are paying too large of a percentage of their income on energy bills, having trouble affording paying for energy, known as energy cost burden. Um, and there's an opportunity in this transition to change that and make costs more affordable for residents um, and really directing the savings of the clean energy transition toward those who need it most. Um, so as we're balancing sustainability and making sure it's equitable, making sure it's affordable, we also need to make sure we're maintaining a reliable and resilient energy system, even as we're bringing on more solar and wind onto the grid, um, and even as climate impacts are intensifying. Um, so we're really thinking about preparing for these impacts holistically as we decarbonize. Um, next slide. A little bit about our office. So I mentioned I work for the Office of Climate and Environmental Justice. Um, this brings together the previously separate offices of sustainability and resiliency um, together to really think holistically about climate mitigation and adaptation through a justice lens. So society has had a long history of pushing disproportionate share of environmental burdens onto communities with a majority of low-income residents of communities of color, often those with the least amount of political power um, and also the least contribution to environmental degradation. So our office is focused on environmental justice and really working to address um, these inequities by ensuring access and inclusion for people throughout the planning process um, and really closing the gap on exposure to environmental and health hazards, including in our air quality. Um, climate justice sort of takes this one step further to recognize that these same historically overburdened communities that um, are, are also most vulnerable to a rapidly changing climate. Um, so climate change really tends to exacerbate existing socioeconomic and health inequities. Um, so frontline communities really need to be prioritized in this transition. And so we're thinking about how best to do that when it comes to energy. So a little bit more about what the energy transition entails on the next slide. Um, you'll see the three pillars that are generally accepted of how we're actually going to make this happen. So the first step is reducing demand. The less energy we use, the less new clean energy resources we need to build and pay for. Um, so energy efficiency can really range from something as simple as installing high efficiency light bulbs like are shown here. This is Green City Force handing these out in the Bronx. Um, or it could be a more complicated weatherization process like upgrading to more efficient windows, improving your insulation, things like that. Second pillar is switching to electricity. So whether that's heating your building with electric heat pumps instead of natural gas boilers uh, or switching to electric buses instead of diesel ones like the one shown here on 42nd Street. Um, and then finally, making sure that all that new electricity that we're using to now power all of our buildings and transportation is clean. So New York State mandates 70% clean by 2030 and 100% clean by 2040. Um, so I'll just pause to note how enormous a task this is. Um, the energy industry has not really changed significantly since its inception over 100 years ago, and now it needs to be completely transformed really quickly. Um, so things are moving, um, and there's really exciting, ambitious uh, new initiatives and funding available at the federal level, at the state level, um, and it's a really exciting time to be thinking about how do we accelerate this transition and make it unfold in such a way that it's more equitable than the one that we've had to date. So that leads me to Power Up, which is the city's energy plan. Um, it is an inclusive planning process for the energy transition. And it's really based on two pieces. First, engagement, and second is research. Um, so first, really understanding and fighting for New Yorkers' priorities when it comes to the energy tr transition is um, what we're intending to do with this project. So we partnered with five exceptional community-based organizations throughout the five boroughs shown on the map here. 
um, and received their feedback and are still receiving their feedback, as well as um, leaned on their expertise and their community trust and on the ground networks that they've already developed within their communities to help engage more New Yorkers in this important conversation. Um, and then the second piece of this process is, of course, research and modeling. Um, there has already been done a lot of analysis done on um, you know, understanding what next steps need to be taken, both at the city level and at the state level to meet our goals. So we really wanted to make sure we weren't reinventing the wheel. Um, we wanted to build off of what we do already know and then identify and develop some deep dive research topics that help fill in the gaps where uh, lack of understanding is really stopping us from making um, action actionable decisions. So you'll hear a little bit more about that research to fill in the gaps tonight. Um, and then in terms of where we're headed, we're aiming to publish a report this April uh, 2023 that outlines specific strategies that New York City is going to take in the near term to advance an equitable energy transition. Um, this will be the first energy plan, but not the last. Um, so we're required by local law to publish an energy plan every four years, which is good because this is going to take a lot of iteration and what's needed now um, is probably going to be different than what's needed in eight or 12 years. Um, so it's a it's a long process, but it's a very exciting one. So we're glad that you're in it with us. Um, so today we're going to talk about the research questions related to electrification of buildings and transportation and how that impacts the grid. Um, feel free at any point to add your questions in the chat. We want to make sure that this is as interactive as possible, and we're happy to answer questions as we go. Um, with that, I'm happy to introduce Zach Satilli, who is the lead consultant on this project at the firm Energy and Environmental Economics, or E3, and he'll kick off our discussion on the research. Thanks, Claudia, and good evening, especially for those who are joining us for a second night in a row. Tonight, we have three topics. Last night, we had three. Last night, we spoke about energy storage, public lands. And tonight, we're going to focus on electrification, as Claudia mentioned. So there'll be three topics and three separate speakers. We'll break in between each topic and allow time for Q&A. I'd also encourage folks during the presentation, if you have comments, start putting them in the chat so that we can prepare ourselves for questions at the end. And then certainly, we'll leave time for anybody who wants to raise hands or ask follow-on questions. So the first presentation tonight will be about building electrification. We're going to be focusing in on not only the feasibility and the cost of heat pumps, but also zeroing in on affordability challenges that we see in rent stabilized multifamily buildings. In the second topic, we'll be talking about transportation electrification. And here again, we're focused on uh, one aspect of transportation electrification. Tonight, we'll be focusing on the rapid electrification of our school bus fleet in the city. And then our last topic is really a combination of the two as we electrify both buildings and transportation. We want to assess the reliability and the resiliency of the city's grid uh, into the future. So without any further hesitation, I'm going to introduce a colleague of mine, Jared Landsman, who's going to cover the first topic. This topic will probably be the longest presentation of the night, so roughly 15 to 20 minutes with time for Q&A. And then the next two presentations will be roughly about 15 minutes each, just so you have a sense of the flow tonight. So Jared, uh, feel free to take us away and I'll advance slides. So just cue me up when you need me to. Awesome, thanks Zach. Um, yeah, so as Zach said, I'm Jared Landsman. Um, so I'm gonna talk about two of our research topics today that uh, we've been working on for the last few months, both related to building electrification. Um, so the first one that I'd like to talk about is uh, sort of our, our research into understanding um, how to address uh, electrification affordability uh, in New York City. And so we're specifically looking at research questions around um, what were what sort of the common barriers to building electrification in um, a specific group of, of the building stock across the city, which is rent regulated unsubsidized housing. Uh, and this actually accounts for a pretty large portion of the, the housing across the city. Um, so it has some some int interesting barriers that come up that um, are, are pretty specific to this portion of the building stock. Um, we're also trying to understand what factors um, can help can are currently exacerbating or could actually help alleviate the cost burden 
uh, that residents will see from electrifying their, their homes and, and specifically within this rent regulated unsubsidized housing stock. Uh, and then we're also trying to understand sort of scaling up um, what would it actually take for what, what kind of investment gap would be required uh, for the city to actually be able to electrify this, this portion of the building stock. Um, already th thinking about the fact that there are a number of state and federal programs that can be leveraged to close that gap. Uh, and we're trying to figure out what, what else could the city focus on and what other actions could be taken to help close that gap uh, once those programs have sort of been used up. Uh, if you go to the next slide, Zach. Um, so we're looking at uh, addressing these affordability challenges in, in a few different ways. So um, this is just sort of a very high level understanding of our approach. Um, so the first portion of this research is, as I said, really trying to understand that citywide investment gap for electrification of, of this portion of the building stock. Um, and there's a number of different things that have to be considered that sort of go into this equation of calculating that gap. Um, so there's a number of costs from electri uh, associated with electrification. Um, obviously the upfront costs of, of equipment, um, heat pumps can tend to be more expensive than standard uh, sort of current uh, typical equipment. Um, and then also specific to this portion of the building stock, we see that there's uh, often a barrier of additional upfront costs that come from health and safety repairs. Um, so these are not necessarily associated with electrification, but can pose a barrier to electrification. Uh, and then obviously we know that uh, like due, just due to the cost of electricity and gas, there can uh, often be an increase in the electric bill from electrification. Uh, on the other side, we have obviously a number of benefits that can come from this. So there's, as I said, a number of existing federal and state incentives um, for electrification and weatherization. Um, there's also a number of different tax credits and financing options that are available to building owners to pursue this route. Uh, and then also with the, um, the new impl implementation of Local 97, uh, we see that there's some benefits that can come from lowering any potential uh, penalties that might be incurred from Local Law 97. And then obviously the elimination or reduction of fuel bills. So taking all these into account, we're trying to figure out what is that, that gap that, that sort of comes from the result of this for all the different customer typologies uh, within the city. Um, and then on the other side, we're really focusing on the customers themselves and trying to understand what kind of uh, energy cost burden might come out of uh, the electrification of this uh, low-income building stock. Um, and so for this, we're really trying to consider different ownership structures that exist across the city within this building stock. So um, obviously there's, there's different uh, rate structures, there's different um, uh, availability of bill assistance uh, for different types of customers. Uh, and then there's also, um, the different just types of uh, utility incentive programs that exist. So um, essentially what, what this comes out to is uh, the final equation is what, what is the energy bill that a customer might see um, after accounting for any sort of bill assistance and then sort of understanding what portion of a, a typical customer's income does that energy bill come out to. And that's how we are uh, viewing our energy burden. You wanna go to the next slide. Um, so as I said, uh, we were focusing on the unsubsidized uh, rent stabilized uh, affordable housing stock. And uh, as you can see from this graph on the right, this actually does account for a pretty large portion of the renter housing across the city, almost 50%. Um, so we, we've sort of felt that the market rate housing had been pretty sufficiently studied in, in a number of different studies over the last few years. Um, and that public housing in the city has sort of its own specific processes. Um, so this portion of the building stock had, had not really adequately been uh, researched before and, and we thought it faced some unique challenges that would be interesting to uh, analyze. Um, yeah, so as I said, it, it's about the, the second largest housing sector for renters. Uh, if you wanna go to the next slide. Uh, so on the other side of things, as I mentioned, um, we are looking at two different topics uh, for building electrification. So the, the other topic is more focused on uh, assessing the feasibility and cost of heat pumps. And this is really uh, focusing on new construction. Um, so this, this sort of this research goal came out of um, 
the need to understand implications and feasibility of local law 154 compliance. Um, and so to really understand this, basically we are, are modeling different representative New York City building typologies um, and really trying to understand how very specific technologies perform with regard to cost and emissions reduction uh, if they were to switch from a typical system to a electrified system. So uh, the specific systems we're looking at are listed below right there. I'm gonna go to the next one. And just to sort of uh, look at all this from a pretty high level, um, the, the two different topics we're looking at. Um, so the affordability topic really focused on multifamily uh, existing building retrofits. Uh, and for this, we're looking at the electrification of all different um, appliances for both space heating, water heating, and cooktops. Uh, and we're doing sort of a full life cycle cost analysis uh, in addition to cost burden analysis and really trying to understand the citywide financing requirements. Um, for the local law 154 topic, this is really came out of uh, the passing of the law and this is actually required by the local law. Um, we're going to look at all the different building typologies for that one um, with a focus on new construction, uh, space heating and water heating. Uh, and really understanding life cycle cost, energy performance, and emissions. All right. Uh, so yeah, so just to do a, a little um, bit of a deep dive, just to give you a sense of um, some preliminary results we're seeing from our analysis. Um, I'm gonna go first into a, some details on the citywide investment gap, and then I'll talk a little bit about the, uh, uh, the energy burden analysis. Um, so I'm going to walk through sort of just an example here of uh, one specific customer or, or building typology within this building stock. So uh, a pre-war building um, that is less a fairly small pre-war building uh, that has 10 units and it's about 15,000 square feet um, that currently has gas and would be switching to an, an all electric system. Um, so obviously first these customers would uh, incur some costs, as I mentioned, due to sort of unforeseen health and safety costs that could come out uh, as, as a barrier prior to electrification. And then uh, obviously there's the incremental upfront cost for the electrified equipment itself. Um, do you wanna go to the next one? Uh, and then as I said, there's sort of all the changes that come out of the um, utility bills. So we would anticipate there being a pretty a uh, high penalty for the incremental electric bill, and then there would be some uh, benefit of a, the avoided gas bill. So we can see here, um, all the dollars here are presented in uh, $2022 per unit or per apartment. Um, so th just for this example building, we can see that electrification poses a pretty substantial barrier. Um, so this is about $75,000 per unit. Um, now, there are already some ways that we can reduce that cost gap. If you wanna to go to the next slide. So as I said, there are a number of existing state and federal programs for electrification uh, to provide incentives, tax credits, and some upfront uh, loans. So, and that, that does pretty substantially reduce that gap, um, but obviously there, there's still quite a large number after that. Uh, in addition, there's an opportunity to um, in, sort of pair your electrification with a shell upgrade. Um, so although Shell Upgrade does have uh, a pretty substantial cost on, of its own, uh, it allows for a smaller heat pump size, which helps reduce some upfront costs, uh, can help reduce that electric bill. And then uh, most importantly, opens up this pool of efficiency and weatherization incentives that can be pretty substantial. Uh, and then finally, if you go to that next slide, um, there is also the option to, uh, rather than do full electrification, look at options for partial electrification. So um, keeping your existing gas furnace to sort of take care of your heating during those coldest hours while using your efficient heat pump for the majority of the year. Um, so after incorporating all of this, we can see that uh, the, the cost gap can be, be shrunk, shrunken down pretty uh, substantially, but there is still money left over. So. This means a sort of like a, a rational customer in this situation or a rational building owner might still not choose to pursue the electrified route. Um, so obviously that there is a, a need here for, for additional funding to, to close this gap and enable electrification across the building stock. 
Um, and uh, so yeah, so as, as I said, where um, what you I just sort of walked through is just an example uh, building typology, but we are looking at this for all different customer types um, that exist within this unsubsidized uh, LMI building stock. Um, so right now uh, we're we're sort of aggregating all these these gaps up uh, to figure out what that city wide financing gap would be. Um, we are also going to sort of evaluate different uh, program participation rates and program uh, funding caps to really understand what the citywide financing gap looks like across the, the city. Um, and we're gonna look at different scenarios of anticipated uh, health and safety issues, electrification solutions and shell upgrades. Uh, before I go to the next slide, uh, I see there's a, a number of questions popping up in the chat. Um, so uh, I'm just gonna start. So uh, question, what, why focus on the increased costs for heat pumps when fossil fuel systems simply won't be an option in the long term? Um, I mean, right now we, we see that electrification certainly does look like it is the long-term solution, but we wanna make sure that uh, sort of no one gets left behind in this transition uh, and we have an equitable energy transition to full electrification. Uh, so I think really understanding these gaps in the in the short term, especially in the next 10 to 20 years, is going to be a, a critical move to ensure that the, the long term goals can be met. Um, another question popped up. Uh, would these retrofits be added to renters bills? A lot of building upgrades are added to the rent and stay on even after the bill is paid. This is a great question. Um, I'm going to try to address that a little bit in the next section. Uh, what are the types of health and safety repairs that you consider in your analysis? Are these things like improved ventilation or lead abatement? Yeah, so I think the main, uh, our research has shown that the main health and safety uh, issues that have popped up as a barrier to electrification are uh, things like lead and asbestos abatement. Um, if uh, a retrofit begins and they uh, basically tear down a wall and see that there is lead or asbestos, now suddenly that has to be taken care of before any additional work can be addressed. Um, so these are definitely things that, um, they're, they're not necessarily part of an electrification project, but can pop up unexpectedly. Um, and then finally, uh, I think the last question in here is, what's the cost per therm and KWH used in the cost analysis? An efficient heat pump should be slightly cheaper to operate than a gas steam boiler at current prices. Um, so. Uh, we are using the the latest, uh, I think that the example I showed before was for a, a building using Con Ed, uh, gas and electric, I think. Um, we're also, uh, I know that Con Ed has recently been, uh, they, they've started a, a new program for rates for all electric customers. Um, so those rate structures have been incorporated into our analysis. So we are um, looking at, at all of those impacts on, on the utility costs. Um, based on our analysis, we're seeing that at least for these specific uh, customers, the, um, the, the, the gas furnaces were, were leading to um, cheaper or lower utility bills than the, uh, the heat pump operations that we saw. All right, uh, oh, one more question just popped up. Uh, managing all the data, decisions, incentives, and contractors to do the necessary upgrades requires pretty high management skills. How is uh, a homeowner like me going to manage this practically and financially, especially when the rebates lag behind the investment? Um, that's a good question. So I will say at least for this portion of the analysis, this is really focused on um, the, the, this funding gap would be for building owners of uh, low to moderate income housing who are trying to pursue electrification upgrades for their, their property. Um, so I do agree that there are definitely still some barriers here to understanding how all the programs and incentives work and how to sort of manage everything. Um, but I will say at least for this portion of the analysis, this is not so much focused on single family homeowners. This is really for the, those larger building owners. Um, for the new construction analysis that we're doing, we are looking at, um, the cost effectiveness for single family homes in addition to multifamily homes. Um, and we are seeing that uh, for the, 
the, the pool of funding for those is, is a little bit narrower and not quite as uh, difficult to, to navigate. Um, and on the whole, single family homes are tending to be much more cost effective for electrification than uh, than the alternative route, with, uh, basically a like for like replacement. All right, I'm gonna continue and then come back to the comments in the chat. If you wanna go to the next slide. Um, all right, so the next section I wanna talk about is the energy cost burden analysis. Um, so there, I think there was already a great, great question in the chat about who actually incurs the cost of electrification uh, in terms of the utility bill. Um, so we are looking at this from a few different perspectives, um, really trying to understand uh, how does electrification impact the tenant bill uh, for different customer segments and how specifically this impacts the bill uh, depending on your starting and ending, ending uh, metering configuration uh, and sort of scenario of utility allowance. So what we see here is just an example from that same uh, building typology that we showed earlier. Um, the, the key thing that we're looking at here, that this is a um, sort of levelized monthly bill um, per apartment uh, broken out by, by different end use. Um, and the, the difference between these bars is uh, really how the building metering is configured and whether the building is pursuing full or partial electrification. Um, so you can basically see if the final metering configuration uh, is uh, putting the, the heat pump costs on the tenant, this can lead to a pretty substantial increase in utility bill. Um, so basically if we start with a metering configuration of central hot water and uh, central heating paid for by the landlord, and now suddenly the tenant has to pay for heating uh, that this can cause a pretty big issue. Um, we can also see that partial electrification can help minimize that increase in utility bill, um, but it does still uh, increase the bill if the heat pump costs are put on the tenant. Uh, if you wanna go to that next slide, I think that's my last slide. Um, so just to sort of frame that same graph uh, in a different way, um, uh, based on the, the data, we uh, were evaluating, we saw that um, the, the median income for a tenant in this type of building is around $47,000 per year. Um, so just looking at that same data normalized by the income level, we can see sort of the percentage of uh, a customer's income that would have to go towards their utility bill. Uh, and based on the New York State energy af affordability threshold, um, the energy burden is really uh, intended to be kept below a 6% threshold uh, for all central heating scenarios. Um, so we can see that uh, in a situation where, where the heat pump utility bill is put onto the tenant, uh, it, it ends up exceeding this limit uh, in those specific situations. So that's definitely something we want to investigate how to minimize that in the future uh, with additional programs and, and additional uh, methods of bill assistance. Um, all right, so I see a number of different questions have popped up in the chat. So I'm gonna go back there. Um, I see that uh, New York City Accelerator provides resources, training, and one-on-one -on -one expert guidance to help building owners and industry professionals. Okay, that's not a question, but that's a great comment. Um, what about multifamily residential that isn't market rate? Um, so this analysis is really focused on that category of, of multifamily residential that is not market rate. Um, are your energy costs numbers publicly available? Um, comparing condensing gas furnaces or boilers isn't relevant with a steam system. Uh, yeah, so we, we are looking at, um, I, I believe all of our cost data will be public by in, in the final report. Um, I, and uh, what you said, yeah, so, so the example I mentioned was for a customer with a gas uh, system, but we are also looking at uh, customers with steam systems. Um, I feel the financing available to for them is sparse, especially with interest rates going up. Um, so we we have done pretty extensive research on all of the available financing options, um, specifically for this category of of low to moderate income building owners. Um, so uh, that will all be, I, I believe, released uh, in our in our final report as well. 
do these cost breakdowns include Con Ed's gas connection fee? Um, I that's a good question. I don't think these costs are including any Con Ed gas connection fee, but I I will definitely double check that and I will look into that. Um, and all right, I think the other questions were just clarifications. So yeah, maybe I'll I'll pause there and see if anyone has any questions they want to ask out loud. Sorry, Jared, I just want to make sure this entire call is going to be on non-market rate buildings only. That's correct. Yeah. So right now the analysis we have um, these sort of preliminary results for is all of the non-market rate buildings, um, specifically the retrofits of uh, the affordable housing building stock. Um, the, we are, as I mentioned, also doing the analysis of new construction looking at those different technologies uh, as part of the local law 154 compliance. Um, and that analysis is still, uh, we're, we're still working on that. So I don't have any results to share for that yet, but but we are also evaluating that. But not, but not retrofits for market rate, correct? That's correct, yeah. We're, we're not looking into that uh, as part of the scope of this work. Thank you. Could I just toss out a question that may, hopefully is relevant enough to, to what you're discussing, Jared? Um, I understand that Con Ed is contemplating imposing a rate hike on all of us customers uh, to cover um, its uh, replacement of many, many sections of piping, you know, citywide, uh, bringing well, in effect, fracked gas uh, to, to all of our buildings. Um, and there's been protests against that. I mean, I've, I've been part of a petition drive to, to say, no, we shouldn't have to pay rate hike for a fuel that goes against, totally against the principles of the CLCPA, the Climate uh, Leadership Community Protection Act. Uh, but is it, I'm, I'm just wondering about your perspective um, or anyone's perspective uh, with, with some sense of whether these pipe replacements are in any way necessary. I mean, if we have aging pipes uh, under our streets, then that's a potential methane leak or even, uh, you know, uh, uh, potential fire. I mean, it's it's really, so I'm, I'm not sure exactly how to how to think about um you know these this this pipeline you know replacement project uh, citywide it looks disastrous because on the one hand it perpetuates fracked gas infrastructure right which is the last thing we need we just don't have time uh however until you know heat pumps and electrification come online we we really have no choice but to to burn gas uh does does that make sense my question kind of yeah so i i will say i don't um i haven't done too much evaluation of those um pipe replacement costs um so mm -hmm. I, I will say that 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 is not currently really within the scope of what i've we've been looking at within this research topic mm -hmm. um zach i'm not sure if that's addressed at all in in the grid readiness topic but um it is definitely something we yeah we, we could think more about okay thank you yeah, you know, all I would add, Jared, is that this, the spirit of much of the work in this report is how to kind of break a logjam and accelerate progress towards things like building and transportation electrification. So absolutely hear the sentiment. Uh, we're trying to figure out ways to make this move faster. And the focus on this specific sliver of quite a large sliver of the, the building stock is that there's unique challenges here as far as ultimately how these costs could flow through to renters. Uh, and because of limitations in, in how those costs could be, uh, how they could flow through, we, we see this potentially being a challenge to get these buildings updated and upgraded. So that, that was our primary reason on focusing on this. Uh, market rate less so because there are very clear ways in, way in which those costs could be passed on 
to renters, whereas here they couldn't. And we're concerned that this building stock won't get upgraded. I, I think we're pretty close on time, Jared. Thanks for keeping us right on schedule. Uh, certainly there'll be other breaks throughout, but I think we should move on to the next topic. Okay, so with with that said, thank you, Jared. And we're now gonna hand it over to another colleague, Krista Heavey, to switch gears and talk about electric school buses. Great, thanks, Zach. We can jump into the next slide, perfect. All right, so like Zach mentioned, um, we are looking at the electrification transition for school buses in New York City. Um, to provide a bit of context for this work, uh, New York City and also New York State as a whole require that um, school buses be all electric by 2035. Um, and this is a really important strategy to reduce the harmful health impacts from diesel emissions as well as the climate impacts. Um, New York City also has a goal that new school bus purchases be electric starting by 2027. Um, so that's another uh, goal that we're considering as part of this work. And to provide some scale of this, there's about 10,000 school buses in New York City. So we have a lot of work to do to transition that fleet to fully electric by 2035. Um, and electric school buses are pretty expensive. They are about three to four times the cost of a new diesel bus. So with this work, we wanted to better understand um, the costs and also the benefits of this transition and also understand opportunities where we can potentially mitigate some of that cost by me better managing um, the school buses once they are electrified. So we have three main goals here. The first is to evaluate the lifetime costs and benefits of school bus electrification as they compare to conventional diesel vehicles. Second, we'd like to understand the opportunities to reduce the overall cost of electrification by changing how the buses are charged and how they're managed. Um, so we'll explore a few opportunities for that on the next slide. And finally, we want to make sure we're looking at um, potential strategies to roll out electrification and really how to prioritize equity goals. Next slide, please. Great. So, um, as I mentioned, part of this work is to look at how we can optimize school bus operations um, once the buses are electric. So we have a few research topics that we're looking into here with our analysis. Um, the first one is managed charging. So electricity costs change throughout the course of a day. There are certain periods where it's more expensive to use electricity. And so by making sure that we're um, incorporating that into decision making about when to charge the buses, uh, the operators could save quite a bit of money by making sure they uh, plug in the buses to charge when electricity demand and prices are the lowest. So that's one strategy we're looking at in our analysis to see um, how feasible that is for actual New York City buses. The second is looking at um, two-way charging or vehicle to grid. Um, so vehicle to grid is when a electric vehicle actually discharges electricity back to the electric grid um, and they can get compensated for doing so. So one strategy we're looking at is if um, bus operators could do this with the school buses in New York City um, and potentially earn a revenue stream for doing that. Um, School buses are widely considered to be a really good candidate for testing out vehicle to grid. So V2G is something we talk about a lot with regards to transportation electrification, but school buses especially are really identified as a potential candidate for this because they have such well-defined travel patterns. They have a route in the morning when they're driving um, students to school, and then they have a route in the evening when they're or late afternoon when they're taking them home. And so that time in the middle of the day when they're parked and that time overnight and in the evening um, is a great time to potentially utilize V2G and earn some additional revenue. So that's a, a second strategy we'll be looking at to see how viable that is for New York City. Um, the next two questions are more operational uh, questions with regards to uh, how to how to do the infrastructure for charging the buses. So um, first is how many chargers to install. So charging stations are pretty expensive and uh, will need to be installed when we're electrifying the buses. Um, but does every bus need to have their own charger or are there potential cost savings we can have by having them share? Um, so that's something we're looking into with regards to um, feasibility for New York City too. And then finally, um, higher power chargers might make there be more opportunities for vehicle to grid, but that's also more expensive. So exploring the trade-offs with that as well. Next slide, please. 
So I wanted to walk through the approach we're taking for this analysis. Um, there's two main steps. Uh, first, the main uh, research item is analyzing the school bus route data specifically for New York City and understanding what the charging behavior will look like. So um, first, we're collecting all of the travel data for New York City's school bus fleet. So we want this analysis to be really specific to the school buses in New York City um, to be able to make sure our findings and recommendations are all specified for the city's buses. Using that travel data, we're looking at the driving patterns to determine when buses need to be on the road driving and doing their routes versus when they're parked. And in addition to that, where they're parked, are they parked at a vendor lot where they would have their access to their charging station or are they parked out where else, are they parked elsewhere in the city where they might not have access to charging at that time? Uh, from that data, we will analyze the um, potential charging profiles for the electric school buses. So understanding based on those driving patterns and when the buses need to be on the road, when do they need to be charging? When are they available to be charging? And when do they actually need to be charging to make sure they have um, sufficient energy in their battery to be able to conduct their whole route? And then finally, looking at V2G. So with all of that in mind, making sure we're supporting the travel needs of the buses and supporting the charging needs um, to get their routes done, is there potential for V2G there based on um, all, of that, all of that data? The second stage of this analysis will be looking at the lifetime costs and benefits of electrification. So first we'll be looking at all of the different costs associated with this transition. What are the upfront bus costs? What are the charger costs? Um, and any other infrastructure, or sorry, the infrastructure for the chargers and then the charging costs themselves. So the electric bills they would be paying for the charging. Second, we'll be looking at potential savings. So how can we potentially save money by managing the charging so that the buses charge at uh, cheaper times of the day? And also, is there a potential for revenue from V2G by discharging back to the grid? Um, and then finally, we'll be looking at all the other benefits that are associated with electrification. So comparing to diesel buses, what are the avoided costs um, of not having to buy diesel for the buses? Uh, what are the operations and savings, uh, operations and maintenance savings as well? Next slide. So as part of this um, analysis, we'll be looking at what the overall transition is to electrification. Um, so to do this, we need to think about how are we electrifying the um, 10 or 11,000 buses in the fleet? Um, what does that transition look like over time? So we're planning to include two scenarios. The ones I've shown here are not final. Um, these are just draft scenarios we're looking at. But the first one in the um, turquoise line is looking at a more even accelerated rate of electrifying buses over time. So putting a, a pretty straight you know, ramp up to get to the 2035 goal. The second option is um, a potentially lower cost option where we do expect that electric bus electric bus costs will decrease over time. That's a trend that we've seen in the EV industry as battery costs come down, the vehicle costs come down as well. So that could be one way to potentially reduce costs by um, having a bit of a, a slower ramp to get started and then accelerating thereafter. But uh, this will also have trade-offs. That means some of our, our key benefits of, of electrification may be delayed. So that's something we, we want to explore to see what uh, it looks like. So I think that's the last um, slide I had. It looks like there um, might be one uh, comment in the chat. Travel patterns are promising, just like private trash haulers, these buses shouldn't be traveling to multiple boroughs throughout the day. Yeah, that's exactly right. So um, yeah, the, the buses typically have uh, more limited routes and, and we are working with Department of Education to understand the actual routes for New York City and how many miles are in each route and uh, what the total travel distance is for each bus to make sure the analysis is really focused on, um, on New York City's fleet. And then it looks like someone sent a link. Um, so I haven't taken a look at this yet. They're noting that EV prices are rising higher than um, internal combustion engine prices. Um, we can definitely take a look at the, the information that you sent. Um, what we've seen is that a lot of prices have declined over time. 
with light duty electric vehicles, part of the, the challenge that might be in the article you're sending is that um, there's also higher end models that are coming out. And so those have higher associated costs. Um, with a, a vehicle like a school bus, uh, we do expect that costs will, will decline as battery technology improves and battery costs come down. Um, but definitely understand the point that, um, that with like a mix of models coming out in the light duty sector that that might be different. But yeah, I'll definitely take a look at the, the resource you set. Thanks for sharing. Um, I think we can open it up if anyone has any questions they wanna ask on the phone. All right, um, I guess hearing none, um, I don't know if Zach, you wanna move on to the next topic? Yeah, we can just pause just in case anybody uh, had a thought and certainly we can save time for the end. Okay, we'll move on to the third and final topic for this evening. Uh, this is really about how the grid uh, can and will respond to electrification in the future, but we're trying to predict uh, what this future may look like. There's a lot of uncertainty around how quickly these technologies are gonna come into the market. We have policy goals that want an accelerated pace and we need to understand if our current grid is ready for that. So I'm gonna introduce uh, Sierra Spencer, who's leading this topic. Thanks, Zach. Are you able to hear me okay? Yeah, we hear you clearly. Okay, great. Um, so yeah, I will be talking about the grid readiness project that we've been conducting. Um, this project has been coming out of a local law, local law 154, which requires that the city conduct a grid readiness study that looks at both the transmission and distribution systems in the city. To address the transmission um, system, we've um, been conducting a qualitative assessment of different efforts that are underway to expand transmission lines into the city. And to do that, we've been referencing works by the New York ISO, as well as NYSERDA, to understand how electrification has been treated and forecasted um, by these different entities. And so listed are some, some different examples of those works. And what I'll be talking about um, for most of today is the distribution level analysis. So for this, we're conducting a quantitative assessment of how electrification will impact the city's uh, distribution grid. And here we're expanding on some other works that have already been done on to the city for the city, um, but we're yeah here looking at the effect of both widespread transportation and building electrification. Um, and yeah, this will be the focus of today's presentation. Um, Zach, you can go to the next slide, please. So the goals of the distribution level analysis. Um, we're evaluating the impact of building and transportation electrification on the peak demand at the Con Edison network level. Um, so these are how the Con Edison grid is just uh, kind of structured throughout the city. And at these network levels, we'll be identifying the extent to which electrification will cause um, a, the exceeded capacity for what is currently available on Con Edison's grid. And based off of these, um, assessments will be making actionable recommendations for how the city can best prepare for electrification. And then we'll also be um, conducting this analysis, particularly through the lens of the city's disadvantaged communities and environmental justice areas, and making separate and distinct recommendations where applicable for these areas within the city. Um, so the modeling methodology for this analysis, we're using the Forecasting Anywhere tool. And this is a tool that's able to provide a geospatial distribution of where electrification will occur throughout the city um, at the network, the Con Edison network level. And this is informed by the actual availability, the technical potential that we see currently in the city, for example, where there are currently parking spaces available that could accommodate EV chargers. And this is also, the tool is also informed by some scenario specific inputs that we um, can, can use with the tool. 
And Forecasting Anywhere utilizes machine learning with historic data, as well as forecasted adoption trends to determine how likely each building and vehicle in the city is to electrify. And so um, this table has some examples of some of the forecasted adoption, adoption trends that are captured with the tool. And noting that this is not an exhaustive list, but an example of some of the, the trends and factors that we've considered. Um, so for example, the ease of building electrification, where we've seen historically that single family homes have been easier to electrify than multifamily homes. And that's a trend that we think will persist into the future. So something that we're capturing with our distribution of where electrification will occur. Um, we also are considering compliance with local law 97 and are forecasting that buildings with higher emissions that will um, subsequently face higher penalty costs from local law 97 will be more likely to electrify, noting that there's not an exact um, correlation, but just kind of a general trend that is captured with our analysis. And then an example from vehicle electrification. Um, so we'd be, we're capturing the fleet electrification requirements. Um, so any state and city requirements for school buses or transit buses to electrify are something that we're able to capture with the Forecasting Anywhere tool. Okay, great. So um, some draft results. So noting that these are still in the works and that these are draft results, but um, are starting to show indications of the types of results that we will be getting from this analysis. On the left hand side, we see a map of New York City divided out into the Con Edison network levels. And here the Con Edison network levels are color coded based off of the peak load impacts from electrification. So this is the impact in terms of megawatts um, or peak demand that are added from building and transportation and electrification combined. And so darker coloring indicates a larger peak impact, whereas lighter coloring indicates a smaller peak impact. And I'll just note for this map that peak impact is sometimes a proxy for electrification adoption, but is not necessarily depending on the timing of, of when the peak loads will be occurring. Um, so is a, a fair proxy, but um, there may be some specifications in terms of timing of when some of the vehicles will be charging or when buildings, elect, uh, electric appliances will be used um, with when the peak load is created. And then on the right, we see a map um, also still with the network levels, but color coding based off of the available headroom on the Con Edison network after electrification occurs. And so this is showing with lighter colors that there is still a lot of headroom left on the network after buildings and vehicles electrify in 2040. And darker coloring indicates that capacity is starting to be exceeded and is being, um, yeah, reaching over over the available capacity given the amount of electrification that is anticipated. And yeah, noting that both of these results are shown for 2040, and we're planning on generating results like these for snapshot years of 2030, 2035, and 2040. And then the next slide, please. Um, so some next steps, um, some of the key conclusions that we're looking to draw from this analysis are being able to evaluate how electrification impacts change over time and be able to determine when grid constraints, um, given when uh, headroom is likely to be exceeded, are likely to emerge. We'll also be able to compare the grid impacts under different types of load management and flexibility scenarios. So these are some of the scenarios that we're planning on evaluating. And from this, we'll be able to determine how load management and flexibility are able to mitigate the impacts of electrification on the city's grid. And then lastly, we'll be evaluating the grid impacts from electrification, particularly in disadvantaged communities, and be able to determine if these communities are more, like, more or less likely to see grid constraints emerge from electrification. And that concludes the slides that I have on the grid readiness study. I'm happy to answer any questions um, that anyone might have. I haven't seen any come up in the chat so far, but let's see. Okay, I have one question. How will grid upgrades and improvements um, to sustain EVs impact utility bills? 
Yeah, so I think that is getting more at some of the cost benefit analysis in the um, school bus electrification study that Krista went over. And so that was looking specifically at the impacts on school bus uh, bills and looking at how um, this electrification will translate to customer bills is out of scope for the grid readiness portion. We're mainly focused on how the city's grid and its ability to uh, distribute the electricity that is needed um, will be facilitated. And so looking at um, bills beyond the, the school buses from electrification are, are out of scope of what we've been looking at with this project. Any other questions, either in the chat or can also open up if anyone um, has any they'd like to, to raise. Okay, I see another question in the chat. Um, although a different topic, will the upcoming Penn Station project, will this be considered? Um, so we, I guess I'm not familiar with the Penn Station project specifically, but will, I think we're, hoping to broadly capture any changes in um, kind of available potential or where electrification is able to occur. Um, although, yeah, I, I can't comment on this specific project at this time. Um, I was just referencing that, you know, there's a Penn Station project at Penn Station in Manhattan where they're gonna build like 11 super talls and it's gonna be this whole big massive project. And then the grid is going to need more capacity just to handle that. So is that just looking at the whole grid entirely? This is taking on a very big part of the grid uh, with this new Penn Station project. Okay, yeah, I mean, I think that seems like something that we would hope to be able to capture. I, yeah, I think that we can definitely look into that a bit more and see if there are any kind of specific forecasted trends in that given uh, geographic area that are not currently being captured, but should be based off of that project. Uh, I think right now, a lot of our um, like forecasts for adoption yeah, are hoping to, to broadly capture those types of trends. Um, but yeah, we'll make sure that the geographic distribution is um, kind of capturing those large projects. Can I throw out a question of kind of, I don't know, selfish personal interest? Uh, the co-op co complex where I live, um, excuse me, um, received a D grade from the city that embarrassingly enough, we feel like we're a pretty progressive community, but the D kind of blights that a little bit. Um, we're a post-war uh, six building complex um, in upper Manhattan. And I, I just wonder if that D grade is rather typical of buildings of that vintage and whether the impending uh, hopeful you know, dramatic improvements in building efficiency that local law 1197, I believe, mandates will improve the outlook in terms of uh, electrical usage and reduce burden on the grid and any any or all of that. Thanks. Yeah. Yeah, I think um, kind of differences in building energy usage and the ease of electrification are something that we're capturing. So we have kind of a few different distinct uh, building vintages that we are modeling for, for different types of buildings. Um, we haven't been able to, like, I think we'll ultimately have the capability, but haven't done this yet to look at how um, electrification trends will vary across different buildings. Um, so whether or not we expect older buildings to have higher emissions or like you've referenced, um, like having lower grades that would be more incentivized to electrify earlier or if perhaps on the flip side, the older buildings are harder to electrify given some of their logistical and technical challenges. And so that's a trend that we're hoping to um, eventually be able to pull out of this analysis, but isn't something we've been able to um, hone in on quite yet. Could I toss out one last one since I'm really self-indulging tonight? I'm sure. really fascinated by heat pumps, but I, I understand them only superficially. Um, when we when we're talking about heat pumps, we're talking primarily geothermal energy, I, I guess, right? Is does air sourced thermal energy play a role here as far as 
Newark buildings are concerned, or is is that a question to be to be asking? <laughs> Yeah, no, that's a good question. I think we are looking um, primarily at air source heat pumps, um, if I'm remembering some of the techno uh, technology specifications correctly. Um, and I'm not sure if any of the building electrification analysis um, is kind of has diverged from that at all, but I do believe that we're looking at air source heat pumps. Oh, okay, thank you. Yeah, I, I can just chime in with, we're, we're definitely looking at air source heat pumps primarily for um, all the different building typologies and. The, the retrofits. Uh, we, we are looking at geothermal or, or ground source heat pumps for some of the new construction analysis, but the retrofits are really focusing on air source. Okay, good to know. Thank you. Yeah, any other questions? All right, then hey. I think I can hand it back to Claudia. Thanks so much, Sierra. And thanks so much, everyone, for your really thoughtful questions and engagement tonight. Um, I just wanted to close with a plug for our survey. It's accessible here on the QR code, and we can put the link in the chat as well. It's open for two more weeks through December 21st. Um, and there are some ranking, like multiple choice questions, as well as some short answer questions. So we really welcome your feedback and ideas. Um, the goal over the next few months is to really incorporate public feedback and translate our research findings into specific city commitments um, that city government can take in the near term to put us on track to some of these long term transition goals. And we will publish that in a uh, energy plan report, the power up report by Earth Day of 2023. So hope that you continue to participate in this process with us. Uh, sign up for our newsletter at nyc.gov slash power up. Um, and hope to see you participating again soon. The survey is in the chat. So really appreciate your guys' attention and feedback tonight.